Good afternoon, everybody. Professor Ayorinde reaching you from Lagos, the commercial capital of Nigeria. I do know that those of you joining us from Washington, D.C., it is uh, 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, here in Lagos, Nigeria, the time is uh, 2 p.m. Uh, in the afternoon, so there is a six-hour time difference between Lagos and Washington, D.C. Okay, I do want to uh, talk to a few, a few of you before we start. I uh, want to know what the weather is like in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, Aubrey, can you pick up the phone and tell us what is the weather like in Washington, D.C.? It's 32 degrees and cold. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for those of you joining us from, uh, I mean, uh, viewing this uh, recording from uh, uh, from all over the world, uh, 32 degrees that uh, Aubrey just gave us, that is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so Aubrey, let us now start the session. Uh, we are going to, of course, I uh, want to welcome you to the uh, review session uh, for the second a uh, class exam uh, that is scheduled for some time this week. And for this purpose, we are going to use the, uh, uh, one of the previous uh, second exam by Dr. Bakare. So what I want to do here, I want to go to question number four on the problem set. Okay, what I want to do to start with are uh, the simplest uh, question set in the uh, in this uh, particular uh, exam. Uh, Aubrey, can you go ahead and read this question for us? Question number four. The pro proposed structure for the main organic product. Yeah, Aubrey, go ahead and read question number four for us. Yes. Proposed structures for the main organic products formed in each of the following reactions show stereochemistry of the product when necessary. Oh, okay, thank you. Now, this particular set of questions here, this is just a, a like I told you, before, this is a very simple question. All this requires is for you to, uh, to know your reagents and reactions. So this is basically uh, pure memorization. But you do know, need to know this type of question before you could actually do the more complicated uh, questions. Okay, so let us uh, start with uh, question A. Question A. Uh, what we have here, we have a molecule that has a hydroxy group. You have a secondary hydroxy group here. And then you have a primary hydroxy group here. And you are also given this reagent here. As I told you before, this is a question of knowing what your reagents will do. You are given chromium trioxide in sulfuric acid. Now, what do you think this reagent would do to a primary alcohol and a secondary alcohol? Uh, Aubrey, do you have an idea what this would do? Okay, okay, this particular reagent, therefore, what it does, what this reagent does is to oxidize a primary alcohol to a carboxylic acid and also oxidize a secondary alcohol to a ketone. So in this particular instance, the product we are going to get is this here.
So as you can see here, uh, the primary alcohol in this case, let's take a look at this. Uh, the primary alcohol right here is oxidized to a carboxylic acid. And that is what this reagent will do, chromium trioxide in sulfuric acid. That is what this reagent will do. So therefore, this is a case of knowing your reagent. <coughs> okay, I also notice that uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Joe Oko has joined us. You are welcome. Okay, also, you could also see here uh, that the, this reagent will also transform a secondary alcohol into a ketone, okay? So that is what this reagent will do. So this is strictly a case of knowing what your, re your reagent will do. Okay, now let us go to question B. Question B, in this particular question here, okay, uh, in this case, uh, Aubrey, do you have an idea? What class of compound, uh, what functional group do we have in this molecule? In question B, do you have an idea what, uh, what functional group do we have in this molecule? Uh, you could send me your response through the chat window. Okay, we have a we have a, a ketone and also an ester. Okay, very good. So we have a ketone here. So this part of the molecule here, we have a ketone here, and then on this part of the molecule here, we have an ester. Okay. Now the question is, what does this reagent? Sodium borohydride, what would it do to those two functional groups? Okay, we know that sodium borohydride uh, will reduce a ketone to a secondary alcohol, and also that sodium borohydride will not, will not react with an ester. Okay? Okay, will not react with an ester. Okay, also I do want to welcome our Kessler, you are welcome. Okay, so what will be the product of this reaction? Let's just go ahead and write this here. So the product will be, since we say that the ketone will be oxidized, I mean, sorry, will be reduced to a secondary alcohol. So now we have So this ketone here becomes a secondary alcohol, which is right here. And then the ester remains the same because sodium borohydride does not react with an ester. So as you can see here, the ester functionality here, which is this here, simply remains the same in the product. So once again, this is a case of knowing your reagent. This is a case of knowing your reagent and what they do. Okay, uh, Kessler, is your mic working? I noticed that uh, your mic is not turned on. Is your mic working? Hi. Okay. Okay. Oh, I see your mic is working. Okay, how are you doing today? Okay. Okay, so let us go to question C. Let us go to question C. Okay, I'm going to erase this here. Okay, question C, which is this here. Okay, now what you have here, what we have in question C, 
we are giving this reagent here lithium aluminum hydride followed by dilute acid. Now we know that we also have, in this molecule that we are giving, we have, uh, can anybody tell us what, fly, what functional group do we have here? Can you just tell us what functional group do we have in uh, problem number C? What functional group do we have? Just send your, answer, your response to, through the chat window. Okay, of course we have a ketone and a carboxylic acid. Okay, very good. So we have a ketone and a carboxylic acid. Now we also know here that the uh, lithium aluminum hydride will convert a ketone to a secondary alcohol and also that lithium aluminum hydride will convert a carboxylic acid to a primary alcohol. Okay, so let us see what will be the product here. So we have the ketone is converted to a secondary alcohol and the carboxylic acid at this point is converted to a primary alcohol. So folks, it is important that you know what these reagents do. Uh, this set of questions is simply testing your knowledge of the reagents, what they do and what kind of uh, reaction that the, uh, the uh, what kind of functional groups the reagents will react with. So in this particular instance, therefore, Take a look at this again. We find that the ketone here is converted to a secondary alcohol by lithium aluminum hydride, and also that the carboxylic acid, which is this here, is also converted by lithium aluminum hydride into a primary alcohol. So that is important. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, let us go to question D. D. Okay, this here. Okay, for question D, this is actually a very special reaction. Now, in this particular reaction here, anytime you have, this is what they call, what we call an, a tile, anytime you have this type of molecule here, we call this an a, a tie or and anytime you have that and you have bromine, you have bromine just as you have in this case, what is going to happen here, we are going to join the two sulfur atoms. These two sulfur atoms will be joined together. That is what the bromine will do to this react to this molecule here. Okay? So in this particular instance, therefore, you have bromine reacting with cyclopentane thiol. Uh, this is cyclopentane thiol. Cyclopentane thiol. That is this molecule right here. So bromine is going to react with cyclopentane thiol, and what do we have to get? We are going to get a coupling of that molecule in which in which the two sulfur atoms will be joined together. So what will be the product here? We have this. So anytime you see bromine and a thiol, what that is going to do for you, the bromine essentially uh, will enable the two sulfur atoms to join together. 
So you are essentially going to form almost what we might call a dimer. Okay, so you, you have here the two sulfur atoms are joined together. And that is what this reagent will do, bromine in the presence of a tile. Now, if you follow what I've just given you so far, can you give me an artifice? Okay. Okay, very good, very good. Okay. I also want to welcome our Faith Mitchell. Our Faith Mitchell has just joined us. Our Faith, if your mic is working, can you turn your mic on and say hello to us? Okay. I'm afraid I did not hear your voice, but I, I noticed that you turned your mic on. Okay, I also, okay, very, I also see that you are trying to do, uh, send me a text uh, message. Okay, very good. Okay, let us continue here. Okay, so let us take, uh, let us now go to problem F. F. Let's take this out. Okay, problem F, uh, which will be this right here. Okay, now in problem. Okay, in problem F, we have an aldehyde. We have an aldehyde uh, functional group right here. And we are given silver oxide in the presence of ammonium hydroxide. Now, what this reagent would do to an aldehyde is to convert an aldehyde to a carboxylic acid. So, this is what we get here. We get this here. Okay, so it, it converts the aldehyde to the uh, to carboxylate ion. Now, if at the end of this process you add dilute acid to this, then the carboxylate ion will become a carboxylic acid. In addition to that, you are going to form silver. Okay, actually we do use this particular reaction here as a test uh, to identify the presence of an aldehyde in a sample. In this particular case, when you add the silver oxide in ammonium hydroxide to any sample and you have an aldehyde in that sample, what you get, you get the carboxylate salt, okay, which can lead to carboxylic acid, and then you get the deposit of silver. And we actually call this a silver mirror test. We call this a silver mirror test. Because uh, when you do this particular reaction here, the surface of your test tube is converted, is, I mean, it's coated with silver, and that gives the appearance of looking into a mirror. So that is why we call it the silver mirror test. But the important point here, though, is that any time you have this reagent, any time you have this reagent, and you have an aldehyde, the aldehyde will con be converted to a carboxylic acid, and then you also form a silver, silver metal in this case. Okay, let us finish the question on this, uh, on this series. Uh, let's go to G, question G. Okay, in this particular instance, this is also one of those very uh, 
specific reaction here. Uh, in this particular react, as, as, as set of uh, reactions here, we are given a secondary alcohol, as, and the secondary alcohol is supposed to react with uh, phosphorus tribromide to form a product. We don't know what that product is yet. And then that product now will now react with thiourea. This is what we call thiourea. to form another product. Okay, so what do we have here? Let us do the first one first. Take all of this out. Okay, let's do the first one. What happens when phosphorus tribromide as we say secondary alcohol, what product do you expect here? Phosphorus tribromide reacting with a secondary alcohol. What product do you expect? What does phosphorus tribromide do to a secondary alcohol? Okay. Okay, of, of course, the bromination. Okay, very good. In other words, it will convert the secondary alcohol, it will replace the hydroxy group of the secondary alcohol. Very good. I see your answer, Kessler. Very good. It will convert the, uh, the hydroxy group of the alcohol to uh, bromine atoms. So, therefore, the product here will be this here. Okay, keep in mind that is what that reagent does. Okay, the, the phosphorus tribromide, which is this here, will convert the secondary alcohol, which is this here, to, uh, uh, to an alkyl bromide. In this case, the secondary alkyl bromide, which is this right here. Now, once you form the alkyl bromide, the tau urea, I know this is a very spe uh, specific reagent. I will tell you now what it does. This tau urea right here, what it does is to convert, is to replace the bromine atom, to replace the bromine atom of a secondary acid bromide or primary acid bromide. It will replace the bromine atom with SH. So now you are going to form a tire, okay, with SH. So that is what this reagent will do. So therefore, what will be the product here? Be here. Okay, keep that in mind. This is a very specific reagent this, uh, using a tau urea, which is actually this structure here. The tau urea, we have this here. Okay, so we call it tau urea. So what tau urea would do, anytime you see tau urea and you see an alkyl bromide or sometimes an alkyl chloride, what it would do is to replace the halogen, in this case, uh, bromine with SH for an hydrogen. So keep that in mind. So all of these questions that we have just, just uh, given you here, uh, they, have to, they are dealing with knowing your reagents. In organic chemistry, uh, knowing your reagents are the basics of understanding of organic chemistry. So you do need to know those reagents. Okay, so let us go to question number five. If there is no question, any additional question on this? Okay, let me see who do I need to call on here. Uh, 
Uh, Kessler, if your mic is working, can you turn your mic on and read question number Outline five? Outline of us? Williamson ether synthesis for cyclopentyl methyl ether starting with cyclopentanol and methanol as the main organic compound. Okay, thank you. Now, what this question is testing here, this question is testing your knowledge of the Williamson ether synthesis. In other words, you want to know, do you really know what this uh, 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 process is? Now, let me give you a little background here. In the Williamson ether synthesis, what you have, the basic ingredient is, you have and alkoxide, very often sodium alkoxide, and then you have a primary alkylhalide, most likely alkyl bromide or chloride or sometimes iodide and these two will react and you get both of these will react and you get this product here You get that product. Now you get an eater. So you get an eater as a product. Now, let me, go, in order to help us out, let me go ahead and uh, label this here. Let me call this, this alkoxide. Let us call this compound A. And let us call the acid bromide here compound B. Now, the requirement for the uh, Williamson eater synthesis is that the alkyl group in compound A, the alkyl group in compound A could be any type of alkyl group. It could actually be uh, a phenyl group. It could be a phenyl. It could be a benzene type molecule. It could be any alkyl group. It could be tertiary, secondary, or primary alkyl group. So that is the requirement for the, R, the alkyl group in compound A. On the other hand, the alkyl group in compound B, which is this here, must be, keep that in mind, must be a primary alkyl group. In other words, this bromine atom here must be attached to a primary alkyl group Maybe sometimes secondary alkyl. Maybe sometimes a secondary alkyl. But it is best if the bromine atom is attached to a primary alkyl group or a methyl group. Okay, it could be attached to a methyl group or a primary alkyl group. Okay? Sometimes secondary alkyl. Okay, that, those are the requirements for the uh, Williamson ether synthesis. So now, now that I've given you that uh, background information, let us see what we have here. What have they given us? Keep this information in uh, mind for now, okay? Let me take this off. Now, so what do we have? We are given, they told us to make cyclopentyl methyl ether, okay, which is this molecule here.
That is the molecule they want us to make. They also want us to start from cyclopentanol. Sorry about that. Cyclopentanol and methanol. Take this out of here. Okay. So, what are the starting material? Let us put them down. Cyclopentanol. Cyclopentanol and methanol. Okay, those are the starting material they gave us in order for us to make this molecule here. Okay, now let me go ahead and label this here. Let us call this compound A, the cyclopentanol, cyclopentanol, and the methanol. Let us call this compound B. Okay, now the question I have for you is. Which one of these compounds here will be the source of the alkoxide? Okay, that is the first question I have for you. Which one of these will be the source of the alkoxide based on what you know about the Williamson eta synthesis? Which will be the source of the alkoxide? Is it going to be A or is it going to be B? Okay, excellent, excellent. Okay, Faith said, uh, okay, uh, George, uh, a man said uh, A also. By the way, uh, man, you are welcome. I think this is the first time I am seeing you. So both of, both of you say A. That is correct. It is A because in this case, you are dealing with a secondary alcohol. So therefore, that means that the alkyl bromide must come from B. Okay, because that is the, that would be a methyl. That would be a methyl alkyl bromide. So now, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? Okay, the first thing we need to do, therefore, we take this molecule here. We want to convert this to the alkoxide, and to do that, all you need to do is take sodium hydride, react sodium hydride with an alcohol. You form the alkoxide. Okay, keep that in mind. This is another reagent you need to know. Sodium hydride, in the presence of any alcohol, what it does is to remove the hydrogen of the alcohol to now form the alkoxide. So this is an acid-base reaction. So we form our alkoxide. Now, at this point, we also now need to form the alkyl bromide from the methanol. Okay, so how do I go from here? Let us, how do I go from here? What reagent do I need? To here. Okay, what reagent do I need to go from the methanol, which is this here, to the methyl bromide? Because I do need that in the Williamson ether synthesis. Okay, what reagent do I need? Okay, AB, uh, not exactly correct, no, no. You are almost there, almost there. Uh, try another one, Let's try another one. HBr would be good if you add a tertiary alcohol. But this is a price. This is a metal. Okay, excellent, excellent. Okay, Kessler, John Ray said uh, phosphorus uh, tribromide. That is correct. That is what you need to use. So this is another case of knowing your reagent. Okay, so you use phosphorus tribromide reacting with methanol to give you the methyl bromide. Now, once you get your methyl bromide, you now come here. 
come back to your archive site. You now have Matthew Bromite here that we made earlier. Keep in mind this reaction is what we call an HN2 reaction and that is why we require that the, the uh, living group, in this case the bromine atom, must be attached to a methyl group or a primary carbon, okay? Because it is an SN2 reaction and therefore you get this uh, final product here. Okay, and that is the product they told us to make. Okay, so what have we done here? In how many steps? We have uh, one step, step one, reacted the uh, cyclopentanol with sodium hydride to form the, the ethoxide. And then step two, which is this here, we reacted the, the alkoxide I'm sorry, not the ethoxide, the alkoxide. Then we reacted the alkoxide with the methyl bromide in an SN2 reaction to obtain the final product, um, which is this one here. Which is this product right here. Okay? So once again, folks, uh, you need to know what your reagents will do because without knowing your, what your reagent will do, uh, you will not be able to do organic chemistry. So the first, the first knowledge in organic chemistry is essentially just knowing those reagents, knowing what they do. Very often it is pure memorization, okay? I don't take some time, so I do want you to take time to do this. And what I want you to do, make up a list of reagents. At this point, make up your own list of reagents and what they do. Do not use another person's list of reagents because if you do that, you re really will not understand what is happening. Because if you simply take somebody else's list of reagents, that's almost like taking somebody's book and starting to read it. But when you write your own book, I guarantee you, you have a better understanding of what is happening. Okay, so let us go to question six. Okay, uh, Faith, if your mic is working, reaction scheme can you to read show how you will prepare one six hexane diol starting with four bromo, one butanol, and ethylene. Did you hear me? Okay, Faith, thank you very much. Okay. Yes, yes, I hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so now what we have here, we have, uh, we have this molecule here, 1, 6, exchange diol. That is what they want us to make. Let us write what that structure is. 1, 6, exchange diol. Is this molecule here? Okay, so that is one six exchange diol. That is what they want us to make. Now they also want us to make this molecule starting from four bromo, one butanol, and ethylene. Okay, so those are the starting material. Let us write the starting material for, for you. So you have.
Okay, that is the one, that is the four bromo, one butanol, and also you want to also start with uh, ethylene. That is ethylene. Okay. Now, what do we need to do here? If we do an analysis of the problem here, uh, we notice here, uh, let me go ahead and uh, number this molecule here, the product. Okay, let us say this is carbon 1, carbon 2, 3, take this out of here. This is carbon 4, carbon 5, carbon 6. Okay, if you notice here, of course, somehow down the road, we need to join two carbon atoms to this molecule here, because this molecule here, the starting material, which is the 4-bromo-1-butinol, only has four carbon atoms. And since they also told us we need to use ethylene, that means we need to join ethylene to the 4-bromo-1 uh, butanol. Now, based on your knowledge of organic chemistry right now, I will make an assumption that you need to be able to join this here, this carbon here, to this carbon. Somehow you need to be able to do that. Okay. Now, the first question I want to ask of you is this. Do you know... Can you give me uh, one or two reactions that allows you to join two carbon atoms to form a new carbon-carbon bond? Can you give me one or two reagents that will allow you to do that? In other words, you want to join two carbon atoms. Anybody has an idea? Okay, but at, at this point, we need to join two carbon atoms. Okay. Okay, why are you thinking about that? I know this is a fair, this is a very complex uh, problem. Okay, okay. Okay, so we, we say we need to join two carbon atoms. I will give you a clue here. Uh, why don't you think of the Grignard reagent? Okay, think of the Grignard reagent. Okay, keep in mind, if we join, let me go ahead and number this. Uh, okay, let us say, uh, for the sake of this discussion here, just for the sake of this discussion, let us call this, since I already numbered this one to six, okay? For the sake of this discussion, let us say this is carbon seven, this is carbon eight, this is carbon nine, And this is carbon 10, right here, for the sake of that discussion, okay? Of course, I will call this carbon 11 right here, and I will say this is carbon 12, okay? Now, since we say that we need to join carbon 10 and carbon 11, okay? And I have given you a clue here that we need to use the Grignard reagent. The first thing that should be coming to your mind is, what kind of reaction would that be? How do you join, how do you use a Grignard reagent? In this case, it seems to us that we are going to be forming some kind of primary alcohol, if you look at this. Okay, because if we join two carbons to, to this here, that means we are forming a primary alcohol. How do we do that? Okay, so then, let us go back to knowing your reagents again. Supposing we say we have a linear reagent, if you recall, okay, you have a linear reagent. And I take a linear reagent and I react a linear reagent with ethylene oxide as step one, that you should know by now, and step two, hydronium ion. 
So this is a case of knowing your reagent. I can keep telling you where you know those reagents, you will be able to put them together in a synthetic skin. Now, if you do that, what does that give you? You extend your carbon chain by two carbon atoms. Okay, so what we have as the product here, we have the alkyl group coming from the green yard. Then we have the two carbon atoms come from the ethylene oxide. Okay? So we have that. Okay, so if you follow that so far, give me a happy face. Okay, we know that a green yard will react with ethylene oxide to form a primary aqua. If you follow that, give me a happy face. This is a case of knowing your reagent. Okay? Okay, okay, very good. Oh. Well, the formaldehyde will only give you one carbon atom. Uh, in this case, you need to add two carbon atoms. Okay, so that is why we are using ethylene oxide. Now, another thing that I also need, we need to keep in mind here, okay? I told you, this is the most difficult question in this exam, the way I see it. Now, if we say we want to make a green air reagent from this starting material here, if we say we want to make a green air reagent from that, you cannot make a green air reagent when you have an hydroxy group in the same molecule, you cannot do that. So therefore, before we can make that green air reagent, and then we add the green air reagent with the ethylene oxide, which is this here, we have to protect the hydroxy group. Okay? That is why I say this is a question that is more complex than it seems. Okay. Now, so how do we know, what re reaction do we know that will protect an hydroxy group. Let us see here. To protect an hydroxy group, what do you need to do? Let us say we have an hydroxy group. Let us use a generic hydroxy group. We use a generic hydroxy group. Okay. If we use a generic hydroxy group, and then we react with this molecule here. Let me give myself some space here. If you have an hydroxy group, in order to protect that, you do react with this molecule. Called this tri we call this trimethyl let me take all of this out so that because this is getting crowded here. Okay, to protect an hydroxy group, you take this molecule here, we call TMS chloride. TMS chloride or trimethyl. Silar chloride. That is where we got the TM, TMS from TMS. Chloride. Okay. If you do that, what that will do, this uh, TMS chloride, all you have to do, you don't need to write this structure here. In the future, you just simply write TMS chloride. Okay? That's all you need to do. If you take TMS chloride, you react with an alcohol, 
There you get this. Okay, in other words, what are we doing here? We are replacing, we are replacing the hydrogen of the alcohol with TMS. That is this part of this molecule right here. Okay? Okay? Now, this TMS chloride here is very stable under basic condition or neutral condition. So, therefore, uh, it will not react with a greener reagent. So now let us now go back and do uh, the synthesis that we need to do. Okay, so far, what I've told you now, for you to protect the, uh, any alcohol group or hydroxy group, react with the TMS chloride to form the uh, TMS ether product. Okay, let us uh, not name that. Uh, TMS uh, eta. Okay. Once you form that, then you could then do your green reagent. So, okay, so now let us come back here. Let me go back here and I'll take all of this out. And now see what we can do with this here. Keep in mind that is what. Okay, so now we start with. We now start with uh, starting material. Okay, we start with uh, bromine here. And then we react that with uh, TMS. Chloride. And so we obtain this here. Okay, once you form that, the TMS are uh, eat uh, the uh, product there. Now, we will now do our linear reaction. Magnesium in ether. Okay, that will now give us the green reagent. Okay, so now we form our green reagent here. Okay, so once you form your green air reagent, and now we take the green air reagent, we now react the green air reagent with ethylene oxide, followed by dilute acid. Okay, let us see here. And that gives you the and that will give us the final product, which is this here. Okay, now the question you want to ask is, how do you get the ethylene oxide? Does anybody know how do we get the ethylene oxide from ethylene? Anybody has an idea? How do we get the ethylene oxide from ethylene? 
Okay, does anybody have an idea? Uh, because we are giving ethylene to start with. This is our ethylene here. How do we get the ethylene oxide from ethylene? Anybody has an idea? What reagent will convert a carbon-carbon double bond to an epoxide? Okay, what reagent will do that? Okay, I'm sure you guys know that. That is m fluoro okay, correct. That is m fluoro benzoic acid. Okay, we call this m fluoro benzoic acid, which is this molecule here. That is m benzoic acid. Whenever you want to convert a carbon-carbon double bond to an epoxide, that is the reagent that you need. But you don't need to write this structure here. Just simply write m benzoic acid. That's MCPBA. That's all you need to write. Okay, now once you do that, once you do that, of course, that will give you that will give you your epoxide. Okay, so let us give you the summary of everything that we've done so far on this particular problem. Okay, so what have we done here? We have. Okay, take a look at what we have. They, get, they told us to make this compound here, okay, which is the 1,6-exchange diol. Okay, they told us to make that compound, which is this here, fine. And they also told us to start from 4-bromo, 1-butanol, so we did that, and also ethylene, and so we did that. So therefore, what we, the first thing we did was to protect the hydroxy group in this molecule before we can do a linear reaction. So therefore, this is the protection here. You use TMS chloride to protect the hydroxy group. And then once we did that, then we form the linear reagent with that. Now what happens, this TMS eta it's very unstable under acidic conditions. So when we react with we react the linear reagent that contains the TMS eta function, when we react it with epoxide first, and then we add the dilute acid, the dilute acid will simply convert this eta, uh, TMS eta back to the hydroxy group. And that is what we have done here because this TMS eta fun uh, functional group is very unstable under acidic condition, okay? And then we also know that the linear reagent will react with the epoxide to form the primary alcohol. In this case, we are extending the carbon chain by two. Okay, now if you follow that, give me a face. If you follow that, give me an artifice. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, for those of you who uh, do not, you may want to just stay behind after this uh, presentation uh, once we finish the regular presentation. I see that a few of you, uh, maybe one or two of you still do not understand it. So you may want to see me after the session today. Anyway. Uh, this is a very complex uh, problem set, but it does require that you know your reagents. Without knowing your reagents, you couldn't do this problem, okay? Because at this point, this is where you now begin to use what we call your critical uh, thinking skill. This is where we now test your uh, 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 critical uh, ability to think 
critically because this is beyond just knowing your reagent. Okay? Okay, now let us go to what time do you have here? Okay, we still have a, li a little bit more time. Let's go to problem number seven. Okay, I believe problem number seven has to do with chapter 16 of your book. Uh, okay, Aubrey, if your mic is still working, can you go ahead and read question number seven for us? Give the structure of the products formed in each of the following reactions. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now, this set of questions here, this, once again, these are some very specific uh, questions. These are not general type uh, reactions. Now, this is in, I believe this is in chapter 16 of your book. Anytime, let's, let, let's take a look at the A. Anytime you see an aromatic chloride, of uh, uh, bromide, halogenated uh, benzene. In this case, we have uh, chlorotoluene, uh, this compound here. Anytime you see an halogenated uh, benzene molecule, and you see this reagent here, hydroxide, in this case, sodium hydroxide, with high temperature, with high temperature. What this will do, let me just give you a little background here. If you have this, if you have this molecule here, it could be a bromide, for example, and you have hydroxide in the form of sodium hydroxide or sometimes potassium hydroxide, and you have very high temperature. In this case, they are using 350 degrees. This is a very extreme temperature indeed. Now, what this will do, okay, so I'll put uh, heat here, very high temperature. What this will do, the hydroxide will pull off this hydrogen here, will abstract this hydrogen, and at the same time, when it does that, it leaves behind a pair of electron, in other words, this is an acid base reaction. This will come here and then leave this behind. Okay, leave the pair of electron behind. The hydroxide comes here, pull this off, okay, and then what do you get as an intermediate? You get this intermediate. This intermediate is extremely reactive. We call it benzene. Benzene is extremely reactive. And of course, since you are also forming, forming water here, The benzene is extremely reactive. So what it does is to now add a molecule of water. The benzene will now add a molecule of water. So what is the product you are going to get? You end up getting this here. Okay, so you now end up forming, uh, forming uh, a phenol in this case, in, but the net process of this is, anytime you have an halogenated benzene molecule and you have an hydroxide with, a, with high temperature, okay, it goes through formation of an intermediate ben, uh, benzene and then ultimately the benzene will add the molecule of water to itself and then you get this product. That is what you get. Okay? So, okay, now let us now go back to this particular problem. 
having given you that background, Okay. Okay, so what would be the product here? Uh, the product here would be in this particular instance we have actually we are going to form two products here. Okay? Let's say we have the okay. Okay, we have a case in which we form right here. OH here. And also another product. So we actually form two products here. OH here. So we form two products in this case because the initial formation of the benzyme, in the initial formation of the benzyme, in this case, let us look at this here. If we say we form the benzyme, if we start with this here, this molecule here, Let us assume that we start with this molecule. Okay? And we form the initial benzyme. Okay, let us see here. I'm trying to let me put this here. Okay, let us say we have this here, this here, and this here. And of course, the chlorine is here. Okay, so we form the initial benzyme right here. What I'm trying to do here is explain to you why you form two products. Okay, so this is your initial benzyme. Now, once you form your initial benzyme, keep in mind you now have water here. Okay? Now the reason why you form two products, it is possible that the hydroxy here could add to this carbon here. In that case, if it is in that case, you form this product. Oh, I'm sorry. In that case, you form this product. Take that back. In that case, we form this product right here. If, on the other hand, the hydroxy group adds to this carbon here, okay, in that case, you are going to form this product. And that is how you form the two, uh, uh, the two uh, phenolic uh, products. Okay, but the mo most important information here, though, is that any time you have sodium hydroxide, high temperature, and you have an halogenated uh, benzene molecule, you are going to lose the halogen, in this case chlorine or bromine, and replace with an hydroxy group. And that's essentially what we've done here, okay, uh, through the formation of a benzyme. Okay, now let us go to the next one, which is B. Go to this one here. Take this out of here. Oh, by the way, since we are doing this uh, A, let me go ahead and jump to C, because A and C are similar. Before we do B, let us go ahead and finish our uh, do, uh, do C. Let us do C. Because you can see here, the uh, A and uh, uh, C are similar. The same condition, sodium hydroxide, high temperature. You have 
chloro, nitro, or benzene. Okay. So in this case also, what are you going to do? You are going to form. Uh, how many products do you think you will form here? Anybody has an idea? How many products do you think you are going to form? Okay, just send me through the chat window. Okay, you said it is going to be two, it will be two, it will be two. But once you form your benzyme, the OH can go to any one of those uh, uh, benzyme carbon. Okay, so let us see here. The product will be this. Uh, Could be this, or it could be this. Or it could be this. Okay? So those are the two products. Okay, okay so uh, problem uh, 7A and 7C are similar in that regard. Okay, now let us go to B. Okay, somebody asked a question for me. But can't you form benzene on both sides of the... Yes, yes, yeah, it is possible. Yeah, you could form benzene from both sides, but they will give you the same product anyway. Because in this case, you are dealing with a symmetrical molecule. Okay, another question somebody asked. Can an OH not be put in the auto position? Oh no, because don't, no, you cannot put the OH in the auto position. That's a good question, by the way. Keep in mind where your oh, okay. oh, oh, I see now. Let me take that back. That was a good question. Uh, somehow that uh, okay, that that is a good question. Oh, okay, very good, excellent question. So yes, it could be. Those of you who say three products, you are right. Let me take that back. You will get three products, okay? Those of you who say three products, you guys are very sharp today. Very good. Excellent. Okay, because, yes, that is correct. Because, okay, now I see. Let me thank you very much for that clarification. But if you form your, let us uh, go ahead and number this. Excellent, excellent observation. Thank you. Okay, this is carbon one, carbon two. Carbon three, carbon four, carbon five, carbon six. Okay, it is possible for you to form a benzene between carbon five, four, and five. In that case, you will get a OH in on position four. You also get OH in position five. Great. It is also possible to get the benzene between position 5 and 6. In that case, you will also get excellent. Thank you so much. I almost overlooked that. So the person who said three products earlier, you are right. Okay, so I stand corrected. Okay, so let us see the other product here. Okay, so let us see here. Yes. Okay, so it is also possible to get this here. Because if you form your benzene between uh, position 5 and 6, then the OH will go to uh, position 6, which will be this here. Okay, or it will go to position 5, which will be this here. So, excellent. That was a good question. That was, you have three possible uh, products. Okay, good. Now, let us go to B and then finish this question here. Okay, B. Let me erase this here so we can do B. Yeah, that's some very good exchange right there. I, I like that. That was good. Okay. Uh, for B, now in the case of B, you, you see I have sodium hydroxide. But the temperature is not that high. You know, this is kind of temperature you can get at, uh, in the laboratory, uh, 80 degrees. So that's not very high temperature. So the distinction between problems uh, A and C and B is that the temperature is different. Now, 
We also have here, any time you have an halogenated uh, benzene molecule in which you have an electron withdrawing group, in this case, a nitro group, in the auto or para position, in the auto or para position, this is the para position relative to this bromine here, anytime you have that and you have a sodium hydroxide, you get what we, what we call nucleophilic nucleophilic aromatic substitution substitution reaction. In this case, you are simply going to get the replacement of the bromine atom by the hydroxide a hydroxide group, okay? So the product here will be a simple case of nucleophilic aromatic substitution. In other words, you get what we call addition elimination reaction. Okay, so you have that. You have that. You have that. And this only happens, in this case, you are going to substitute the bromine with the hydroxide. So this, this only happens when you have this halogen here in this particular instance, if it is in the auto position relative to, I mean, a para position relative to an electron withdrawing group, in this case, nitro group, or if it's also in the auto position, for example, this molecule here will do the same. If you have this here, either bromine or chlorine in the auto position relative to the electron withdrawing group, okay, you also will get nucleophilic aromatic substitution in which all you are doing here is replacing the bromine or the halogen with an hydroxy group, okay? And that is uh, essentially what you're going to get here. So in this particular instance, okay, this are the product of this reaction is this here. So take all of this out. So the product of this reaction is this one right here. Okay? That's the product for for B. Because all we are doing is simply replacing the bromine atom with an hydroxy group. And the condition for that is you have sodium hydroxide or hydroxide, sometimes potassium hydroxide. Uh, the temperature is not very high. And of course, the bromine or the uh, the chlorine must be in an uh, auto or para position relative to some electron withdrawing group. And some of those electron withdrawing group could be the nitro group or the cyano group, for example. The cyano group, this here, if you have something like this. Okay, the cyano group will also undergo this reaction. I mean, uh, the uh, molecule that contains the cyano group and a bromine atom or halogen atom are uh, also of para to that cyano group will also undergo this particular reaction right here. Okay, so we have finished question seven. Uh, let's up before we go, uh, we're almost here for 90 minutes. Let's do one more question. I would like us to do a... Uh, uh, yeah, we would like to also do a mechanism question before we go because so far we have not done any reaction mechanism. And by the way, if your react, if your, uh, I don't know what time your exam is. If your uh, exam is not this week, then uh, this coming the next Sunday, a week from now, I will also organize another review session for you guys. But if your exam is uh, this sometime this week, then we cannot do that. Uh, so I will check with Dr. Bakari to see. If it is next week, then I will organize that we have another review session uh, just to help you guys out. 
Okay. Now let us do question eight. Let me see. Uh, Kesla, if your mic is working, can you pick up the mic and read question eight for us? Evidence for the intermediate carbocation and the acid catalyzed dehydration of alcohols comes from the observation that rearrangements sometimes occur. Propose a mechanism to account for the formation of 2,3-dimethyl-2-butene and 3,3-dimethyl-2-butanol. Thank you very much, Kessler. Okay, now let us see how do we approach this. Of course, this is a reaction mechanism. Uh, of course, you see, go back to knowing what your reagent will do and all of that. Now, what we have here, <coughs> they have given us 2,3-dimethyl-2-butene, which is this molecule right here. They have also given us 3,3-dimethyl this year. 3,3-dimethyl-2-butanol, uh, which is this molecule here. So now this, say, how do we account for the fact that when this 3,3-dimethyl-2-butanol reacts with uh, dilute uh, acid here, in this case, this dilute acid here, we get a dehydration. And so now we need to account for the reaction mechanism. Okay, now, does anybody know what is going to happen here? Let us do this and then we call it a day. Does anybody know what is going to happen here? Anybody has an idea? What will be the first thing that will happen? Okay. Of course, when you see a reaction mechanism of this nature, you see an alcohol, then you see then you see an acid, in this case sulfuric acid, or it could very well be a hydronium ion that they give you. Okay, it could be hydronium ion. Okay, the first thing that you have to think of, you are going to get protonation of the hydroxy group. And keep in mind, at this point, the product that you're supposed to get here. Let, them, let me go ahead and number these carbons here. Let us say this is carbon number one, carbon number two right here, okay, carbon number two right here. So that is carbon number one and uh, carbon number two. So somehow something is happening here. If you look at carbon number two in the starting material right here, you have three methyl groups attached to it, but now carbon number two in the product only has two methyl groups. So that means there must have been some alkyl shift. Uh, on the other hand, carbon number one in the product right here now has two alkyl groups, so that means, or two methyl groups. So that means there must have been a methyl shift, okay? A metal shift. Okay, so how do we account for that? Okay, so let us see what can we do here. Okay, so therefore, to give the mechanism for this, we say we start with, keep in mind we have, this num when you write the mechanism, you've got to indicate the non-bonding pair of electron on oxygen. It is better for you to do that. Yeah, do that here. Okay. So the first thing that happens, of course, we have, let me go ahead and put this, uh, okay, right, so for the acid here, we have uh, SSO3, okay. The first thing that happens, of course, we have protonation of the hydroxy group. Okay, the non-bonding pair of electron on oxygen comes in to grab the proton from the sulfuric acid, and then you get this. And so what would that give you? You form this uh, intermediate oxonium ion. 
Okay, so we have this here. So you form the intermediate of sodium ion, and then what you see happens at this point, what happens at this point, the intermediate of sodium ion will lose water, because now water is a very good living group. Okay, it loses water. Once it loses water, what do you get you now from this intermediate carbocation? Plus water, of course. Now, see what has happened here. This intermediate carbocation, this is, this here, is a secondary carbocation. Give myself some space here. This is a secondary carbocation. And secondary carbocation will be arranged to a more stable carbocation. In this case, we have a possibility of a metal shift so that we can now form a tertiary carbocation. So we are going to get what I call a metal shift. So this will shift to here. And that is a metal shift right here. Once we get this metal shift, we now have this. And your carbocation is now in that position. So now what do you have here, let me take this water out of the way. Okay. So now what do you have there? What I see here. So now we now form a tertiary carbocation, which is more stable. So now we form a tertiary carbocation. Okay. Now that tertiary carbocation is now set to lose a proton to now form the desired product. So what does it do? Comes here, this water comes here now, will come and grab this proton, okay, and in so doing the pair of electrons are joining the carbon and the hydrogen will now go to form the carbon carbon double bond. And that is how we form this product right here. Okay, so what we, have, what we are giving you there for here, let's see here, give you a summary of everything. Okay, so what we are giving you here, we started with right here, acid base reaction in which the non bonding pair of electron on, on the oxygen atom here will abstract a proton from sulfuric acid to form your oxonium ion. Or protonated alcohol. Now that oxonium ion will lose water very readily to form your secondary carbocation, which is this molecule here. And that secondary carbocation will rearrange as a result of metal shift to form a tertiary, a more stable carbocation, which is a tertiary carbocation, and that tertiary carbocation will now ultimately lose a proton to now form your final product, which is right here. Which is right here, okay? Okay, folks, so we have come to the end of today's session. Is there any question before we leave? 
Any question before we leave? Okay, I, I will stay behind for another five to ten minutes for those of you who want to talk with me of the record uh, after we leave today. And uh, if there are no additional questions, I will say enjoy the rest of your day. I know that you guys have to take off uh, very early on a Sunday morning to attend a, a, an organic chemistry session. So that really shows a very a lot of dedication. on your part. So I will see you guys online again. Uh, so enjoy the rest of, of your day. Thank you.